So, my name's Nick Leonard. I'm uh, an ex in charge of uh, design strategies at KTGY. We're an architectural firm and, and planners. And um, my background comes from the builder side. So for 30 some years of my career, I was a home builder uh, in the sales and marketing at, arena, in the product development arena, in the land acquisition arena, dealing with uh, large builders and small builders for my whole career. Now I'm on the architectural side so the fun thing I get to do is I get to work with builders and my responsibility is to help them determine what types of product, where the niches in the marketplace, how do we target the consumer better, all with the idea of improving the asset value of the land and serving a better marketplace. So as we get into this, It'll have to load, there it goes. So we're gonna be designing for demand. And if you were here yesterday or you are familiar with John Burns, uh, John is uh, heavily into demographics. Uh, the little card that I sent out to you shows how he's splitting it up and we'll talk a little bit about it. But John is, uh, he created a, a new, uh, wrote a book called Big Shifts Ahead. And with the demographics, uh, and some of the other elements in what happens in your life at different life stages and whatnot, how it affects you and where, where you're going. And so the book is incredible. I recommend it to anybody. It's a game changer. If you want to read it and be some, you know, a little bit more smarter than the average bear, uh, Big Shifts Ahead is, is a great book. So as we get into this, and I started looking back at some of the old PowerPoints uh, that I started doing, this was back in 2012, I relate a lot of to the R&D that we're doing uh, with my studio and to the cars that Detroit is doing. So in 2012, this was the concept cars that different firms were looking at. You'll actually see a Honda there, there's a Ford there. Um, and what's interesting about this, when we start going small, which is what the cars are, are related to, you can see that there's elements of one, more glass, two, they're pretty cool on the outside, three, you've got different ways of entering and exiting the car, and four, when you get inside the car, the cockpit's different. So have any of you been to a car show and seen, and it's always fun to get in the, you, first of all, you like the car, then you wanna get in it and kind of feel it and see how it lives. Why don't we design houses like that? So it was really interesting, so to do this in 2012, I thought, wouldn't it be fun if I went and researched concept cars today? Quite a bit of change. Three of them fly. All right, so Tesla, you've got a GMC, you've got a BMW, you've got a Jeep. So all of the car manufacturers are looking ahead and what that is. Now, will these ever hit the streets? Probably not. But some of the R&D products that I'm gonna be showing you, they probably won't hit the streets exactly as they're designed, but we'll take elements from that and go through it. So. As we get into this, I wanted to go through these. These are universal trends that, in design that are happening from East Coast to West Coast. Uh, all the builders, all the marketing people can agree, and I think if you go through these, you'll agree too. So homes are getting smaller, higher degree of privatized outdoor spaces, indoor, outdoor to connectivity, that's the doors, how are they opening them up? You can go over to the show and see just tons of the new sliders and sliding glass walls and, and those type of things. So we're getting into personalization. If this was prioritized, personalization would be number one because that's what consumers are really looking for is more personalization. In fact, if we owned the same house, all of us, we would all live it differently. So as an architectural firm, how do we create that house to basically allow people to live it differently. Uh, we get into super kitchens. Obviously, you've seen that, the big islands. And by the way, they've reached a limit. 
okay? We'll get into that in, in, a, in a, a few slides more. Uh, we're talking larger media areas. When you go to Costco, you go to Lowe, uh, not Lowe's, but, uh, well, it would be Lowe's. Uh, you go to uh, Sam's, any of those, the very first thing you're hit with it, 75 inch screens. Well, we have to design to that or we're gonna blind everybody. So the scale of, of the media rooms now has changed. We get into spa-like master baths, uh, covered outdoor rooms, larger garages. We're not parking garage or cars in garages. We're using it for storage, all right? So it's becoming actually idea space. So you're seeing man caves, you're seeing uh, retreats for women, all, all sorts of things happening in those garages. And then more storage, storage, storage. There's never enough storage. Uh, we're getting into dual use homes, technology obviously, and volume. Because in the last downturn, we cut all volume out of the house, made it cheaper to build, lower the plate lines. And now when you add a little volume, people go, wow, this, this is really good. So. Uh, lack of attainability is, is in every market that, that I go to from West Coast to East Coast. Uh, people are all, all builders are trying to find, even land developers, how do I get land and the house where we can get to attainable? And attainable is at different levels for different people, but it's that comfortability level to purchase. So this is old school thinking. We always talk about the boomers, we always talk about Gen X, and we always talk about the millennials. Well, in each one of those, there's basically 18 to 20 years of people. So John Burns, and, and yesterday he gave his presentation where he actually cut it up into decades. Because the leading edge, so if you take as an example the boomers where you have the, the population boom going, the 40s and the 50s, these people are totally different than those people. So we're a leading edge and a trailing edge. My son is a, a millennial, and he is a leading edge millennial. And so he's in, in his mid-30s, getting close to 40 now, and then you have the trailing edge. So different things that happen, and it's all explained, but what I was doing with John, and so we got this information, and I said, gosh, what if we found a lot size that was, was a workforce or workhorse kind of lot size that we could take that lot and build it with a home on it that would basically target all of the different life stages? So we'll get into that. This is Phoenix. Phoenix is one of the larger markets. How many people were, how, how many people are from East Coast? Okay, how many people, Western? Midwest? Okay. So in each of your markets, you'll have a huge housing, whether it be Denver, whether it be Dallas, whether it be Phoenix. This is Phoenix. This is just one quarter of Phoenix's market. There's 524 projects open in Phoenix. So if you're a home builder, and this is a value ratio graph for, for builders, this is square footage going across. So Basically, if you had a 2,000 square foot house, it would sit somewhere in here, and then your price range. That circle represents 151 plans that are offered in the Phoenix market, just the Western Phoenix market, that is between 1,800 and 2,100 square feet. 151, so if you're a builder, you're going, well, I'm, I want to build an 1,800 square foot house. How are you going to compete? So the idea between, between, or with that would be, let's do it through design. We'll, we'll design a better house. We'll put hooks in it and neat things with it. We'll take that menu of trends and we'll check them off and we'll create all of those. So that's one way of going. Or some builders just do it by price. Slice the price and I'm gonna take my 1,800 square foot house and get down here where I'm not competing with all those people. Builders are building for money. <laughs> they don't like slashing prices. They don't, you know, they're there for the profitability. So how do we start looking at the design and how do we start getting to that attainable? So as we start looking, this is a 45 by 110 lot. 
it's, it's very traditional for every market in, in the United States. But this particular house has all the elements that are within those trends. And the problem with the 45 foot wide lot is two thirds of it is garage. So you're gonna end up putting a bedroom there. That's the only thing you can put there really because uh, it's not enough living space and you gotta get a front door. So from there, how fast do we get the house to read across where we're doing kitchen, dining, family room? How do we open up the space to the outdoors? How do we create the master? And then we create a casita that's attached to this open space and that becomes idea space. It can be a casita, it could be an entertainment zone, it could be a party place, it could be a, a kind of a hobby craft room, it could be anything you want it to be. Wherever we've introduced this, this little box, it's glassed in, it's just a box. People love it because each one of the people that purchase that house envision that in a different way and a different use. So this is one way of tackling it. So as we start to look at each one of these, these profiles, these decades, if you will, of, of consumers, it was very interesting to take that workhorse lot and we'll design a house for it. So if we kind of looked at that workhorse lot, would it be a 60 by 110 or a 120? No, the idea is we're gonna compress it. So the land becomes cheaper and we can get closer to the attainability. So we found that a 60 by 70, which is 4,200 square feet, or a 60 by 75 would give us single story living, would be able to tackle two story houses. We get all sorts of garage configurations and yet we're still only on a 4,200 square foot lot. So if we go through this on each one of them, this is for the achievers. This is the generation born in the 1940s. They're looking for pure single story. So we can get a pure single story house on it. Two bedrooms or three bedrooms, their choice. Kitchen, gathering, dining, outdoor living covered, backyard, and a very nice master suite with some storage. So that's for the 40s. Now as we get to the 50s, these people are a little bit younger. They still have guests and children coming to visit. So maybe what we do is we create the master bedroom suite, but we create a staircase. And in that staircase, it leads up to auxiliary space. It could be a secondary master. It could be uh, two bedrooms for the kids. It could be a play area. It could be a loft. It could be all sorts of different things that you can happen. But the idea behind it is they live on grade with a bedroom and then you have the auxiliary space. As we get to uh, the next, and by the way, I'm putting in some eye candy because I'm a floor plan junkie and I can talk floor plans all day long. If I do that, I might lose a lot of you. So I'm throwing in some eye candy here and there. This is, this is an outdoor patio that is between a family room and between a kitchen. So the idea behind this is it's a side courtyard. So when we talk about privatized outdoor spaces, you need to make them private. This happens to be done by toll. And what makes it private is you don't see the neighbor. This is a 10 foot wall. And that privatizes it so John and Mary next door can't look in to your, your privatized outdoor space. And that's what encompasses it and makes it very special. We're moving ahead and we're getting into now the equalers, 1960s, this is Gen X's. Uh, we are creating a master bedroom down, but we're also creating upstairs bedrooms for teenage kids and for relatives that might visit. And you can see now we've expanded the kitchen, the living and the dining area so that because they're still a little bit in, in family mode, they have the scale and the space to be able to entertain. We go to the 1970s and now what they're doing is these people are starting to prepare for the parents they're coming back to them and living with them, or maybe they have a boomerang kid and they're bringing him back. So we've created 
a full-on next-gen guest suite, complete with bathroom, complete with bar, complete with little sitting area. And then upstairs, we have a luxurious master. And we're going to get in a little bit to the masters and those kind of things when we get to what women want. So up, going back. So 60 by 70 still. These are for the, the new gen Ys that now are in family mode. And what we've done here is we've created a three car garage, turned it, so you're getting three active garages, you're getting a full bedroom guest suite down, and you're getting a huge entertainment dining kitchen area going across. So all of this is on a 60 by 70. It has resonated with East Coast and West Coast. This is actually being done in Phoenix. Now we're this R&D that we did, builders have grasped it and is starting to go. Fielding Homes took it uh, in Raleigh and uh, we're starting now to get with developers and developers are starting to say, well, wait a second. Maybe I shouldn't do a hundred deep lot. Maybe I should make the house a little bit, or the lots a little wider shrink the lot a little bit, and I, and I can get a better scale of design. So as I started doing this, and this started with John Burns, where they did some research on what women want. So I worked with uh, Molly Carmichael, and I said, I'll, I'll do an R&D on what women want. So tell me what women want. I'm not a woman, I don't understand what they want. I have a wife, I know what she wants and I know what she doesn't want. So she says, well, they want organization. They want more structure in their house. They want, and I'm going, you have to define that. I understand more light, but I don't understand the other. So the idea behind this is women today, through a lot of the research, 58% of the women, are now college graduates. They're starting to make incomes that exceed the men. There's a reversal happening. So women are breadwinners. Women are partners and spouses. And women are mothers. So they, and, and the DNA is they gotta be perfect at everything. So in the process of that, it is how do we help them do that? What does it look like? And so what we first started looking at is one, we created a two car split garage. We found through focus groups, women will like separate garages. I want my garage, you have your garage. Okay, is that right? So do builders do that? No, they don't. They put the two cars together, it turns into his space and she's going, can't you clean that thing up? Okay, so, so we did a two car split we put a storage space in because people have bicycles. People might even, how many people have two refrigerators? Where are they? Basement, okay, garage. Okay, so it's taking up space somewhere. So what if we created in the garage a space for something like that? 86% of all buyers have bicycles, sometimes more than one, where do you put it? So we created storage. In that storage, you see there's a little porch. This is an Amazon drop zone. So you go to the, you go to the, the post office and you'll see a package drop where you pull it out, drop a package in and it closes and so it's protected. So you're gonna start seeing more and more of those Amazon drops where it's protected instead of having some kind of a safe that uh, people put things into. So, uh, so that's number one. Number two, as you come in, women, do you want the den at the front of the house or in back of the house? Because believe me, the den, as you see it in a model, will never look that way once you move in. And when you have people come see you, you're always going to be saying to your house spouse, clean it up. And then you end up just closing the door and people can't see into it. So what we're trying to do is tuck it, tuck it back in, get it away from the entry. So that's number one. Women want a powder room. So if you have bedrooms and you do two baths, 
Well, one of the baths is going to be used for guests, so if you have a guest, then the powder room or the bathroom and the powder are, are so most women want a separate powder room for guests. They also do not want to see the kitchen when they come in. So the kitchen is tucked back in. We've got great uh, room, dining, and then we opened up, and you'll notice that we got a huge walk-in closet that connects with the laundry. And then we have a spa-like master bath and plenty of, of bedroom space, but we created this retreat. And I can't get into all the different ways it can go, but it is her space where she can close off the doors. People can't get to her. She can meditate, read, have her own space. And by the way, this can move to here and it can move to there for different uses in, in the house. So we've been trying to, to, to develop what this is because 92% of all decisions made on a house are made by a woman, influenced by a woman. So why don't we design more homes to how they really want to live? Um, <clears throat> this is idea space. It happens to be a, if you can picture this, four feet by three feet. It's a walk-in pantry. It used to be a coat closet. And I don't, does it, uh, anybody heard of Molly Carmichael? So Molly, Molly Carmichael, uh, with John Burns and then now with, with uh, Myers, she took her coat closet and turned it into a walk-in pantry. She spent hours on designing it and shifting it and turning it so it would get the maximum capability out of this four foot by three foot closet. And you can see it's pretty cool. She's got a shelf. She's got a Krug machine. She's got a blender in there. She's got all this organized with spices. These are two small refrigerators, which are one for wine and one for sodas for the kids. So she's organized it and she spent hours on this. And it doesn't have to be large. You don't have to have the huge walk-in pantry. If you do the huge walk-in pantry, the idea is organize it. Because remember, women need organization to help their life. So what does that look like? So these are some ideas. And obviously, they're big home type pantries. But you can see they're organized. There's a, there's a countertop in there. Uh, each one of them has a countertop. This has a toaster oven, a, a microwave, and a blender, and your wine. But each one of them has had some design. So if you're going into and saying, we're going to do a walk-in pantry, just don't do a walk-in pantry. Make it a surprise. Put stuff in there, organize it, design it to where it becomes scalable and functional to what uh, women want and toward what anybody would want. OK, so we're going to get into personalization and talk a little bit. Remember my 60 by 70? So I get these wild, crazy ideas sometimes, because I'm not sure that everybody wants to live in a single story house. But if we created four or five car garage, so we could have toys, OK, it's a huge garage. Come in, get a text zone area, really cool. Get your outdoor room, get idea space, all right? Plenty of yard space. Upstairs, we do a single story house. Now, the cool thing about that is when you do a two story and you have the downstairs here and the upstairs up, you've got a problem with your ceiling height. So you can go to 10 feet, you can go to 12 feet, but it costs money to do that. If we put it upstairs, this can become 12 feet because all you got is a roof above it. And so it's real simple to get volume and you can do some really exciting things up there. So with that, this upstairs would always be bedrooms, great room, huge kitchen, dining, and a deck that sits over this. So you get some outdoor covered space upstairs. But if we start to morph it with idea spaces, we can chop off these two areas where the garage or the cars were in the garage and we can get full on next gen suite that can turn into an Airbnb so you can generate revenue. We still get the idea space moving or you can keep and do a full on rec vehicle 
and put a bedroom and a bath down there. You can turn it into a she shed, you can turn it into man cave, you can do all these different things. So the idea is the maximum personalization on a house, making it as simple as we can. Again, this, is, this happens to be a garage and you can see what we're doing is these glass garage doors now, we're starting to insert them into residential housing so that it's very easy to raise and lower and you open up the outdoor to the indoor. So give you a little bit of idea, we're now gonna compact this lot a little bit. This is one of the builders in Sacramento that this is a 50 by 70 foot lot, 3,500 square feet. The cool thing is we get a three car tandem. It's a reverse tandem. So you get this car, that car, which was the stagger that you saw before, and you can get your storage in here, get a great outdoor patio area, and you live, great room, dining, and kitchen to the back. So what happens to this space? We can turn it into idea spaces by now bringing in a man retreat, outdoor barbecue, bigger extended patio, we can then take it to an expanded outdoor space with a huge outdoor kitchen and a secret little space with a slider here. Or we can turn it into a full casita. So what we've done is allowed for the consumer to pick how they want to live that house in some way, shape, or form. And it doesn't have to be a big house. It's only on a 50 by 70 foot lot. So as we start to get into this, and whatever market you're in, you're gonna start seeing more and more clusters coming in. Clusters are taking homes and putting them in pods. And the reason for that is we pick up density. This is a private drive. Four houses are off a private drive instead of four houses off of a public realm street where we've gotta do the right of ways and, and that type of thing. So we start to do clusters. The builders come to us because clusters will pick you up a half to one maybe even a little bit more than one per acre, which is a lot of, of revenue to the, to the dirt asset. So in the process of doing that, can we find a universal cluster? Universal meaning like the workhorse product that I showed you, the 150 by 150 can take on all these different types of houses. So we're gonna take, take you through it. This is four single stories. This is kind of a boomer product. By the way, this will get uh, seven and a half to eight to the acre. And we've got split car garages. Remember, women would like to have split car garages. Three of them have that. We have the outdoor spaces, four units. If we go to six, now we're starting to talk starter families and young couples, and we're actually getting two-story homes and, with backyards, or we can go to eight. Eight, we can still do two stories. Now this is all still within a 150 by 150. Or we can go to 10, excuse me, this, yeah, this is 10, and we're at 16 to the acre, and this is attached. Now we can either do it in a green court where the front doors are on the opposite side of the garage, or we can do it the other way around where the front doors are married to the garage so it feels more like a traditional single family type of, of entrance and we get backyards. So we can get attached product with backyards and front doors. And by the way, the market research says, if I can give you a driveway, the consumer will pay $10,000 extra. If I can give you a backyard in an attached product, the consumer will pay an additional 15,000. And then we can go to detached. Keep this in mind because you're going to see us how we're going to get into these little tiny mini homes. And then we can also take this where we've got actually 12 units within that 150 by 150. So think of a developer has a piece of, of land. They don't know quite exactly what they want to put on it. It's Rancho Mission Viejo, it's Newland, it's, it's uh, uh, any of the major builders, Crescent Communities, whatever, has you know, this, this land. They can plot the 150 by 150s because it's just like this box. We just put them down. We don't have to determine what goes into it till we start marketing it to builders. 
So we can, we can land plan really easy, really quick, and we can get all different types of product in it. So as we go into uh, a new idea, and, and this is, you gotta tell me if this is good or bad. Um, have you heard of co-housing? Okay, Grace Kim, by the way, renowned architect, did a TED Talk. So you could go to Grace Kim TED Talk and you can see her TED Talk, which is really, really cool. And it's all about taking a vertical building and creating co-housing, where we're mixing generations to live there and they all share common spaces. So the idea behind this is, I'm not, I'm not a vertical guy. I'm a low density guy. So how do we do that in, in a small area? So if we took, yep, if we took the 150 by 150 and we carved it up differently into a pocket community where we have an interior space here and the front two lots can be a 50 by 70 lot, a 60 by 70 lot, which all had all those different houses on it, or it has a third, two 35 by 60s. This can be a 50 by 70, 55 by 70, or two 35 by 60s. So we can go one lot, two lot, three lot, four lot, five, six lot, seven, eight lot, and put a carriage unit over the garage for rental. And now we've mixed boomers with millennials, with families for sale and for rent. And the for rent, if you create the for rent, it's owned by one of the people there, so they're gonna take care of it. So on a 150 by 150, we've got a mini master plan. Heck, we got different kinds of product and we got an amenity area that changes different ways and I'll show you what that looks like. And in its capacity at eight units, it'll get 14 to the acre. So let's, let's expand it a little bit. Now you can see where houses are on it. By the way, this particular one shows a 50 by 70 with a full on rental unit in the back. This is a two story triplex that's 800 square feet to 1,000 square feet, so it's very affordable for all millennials. And then we have the three units across the back, an interior amenity space that you can do, well, different kinds of uses. This one is agriculture. You could do a pool. You could do a play area. You could do just about anything you do. But this becomes community. Will it work? For the big boys, probably not. For the smaller builders, it would work perfectly for them because then they can basically plan each 150 by 150 could turn and change with how the market is accepting their lifestyle ideas. Okay, so Tim Sullivan says, compelling product design that motivates is the driver. So I don't care if you go into small, uh, if anybody heard of the Wee Cottages? Okay, so Wee Cottages are in Colorado. You can, and it's Wee Wee, so it's Wee Wee. It's W E E, okay? You can Google it. They're a little two story, one car garage type. Uh, they go directly to the millennial. They're selling them in the low threes and they just blow off the shelf, okay? So that's the key, but how do we design them and make them cool? As we look at this attaining more density, this happens to be a TriPoint project because TriPoint, Toll, Woodside are all clients now that we are working with on tiny houses. So this is, this is not a concept is so far off because everybody's looking for that missing middle. How do we start to get to housing prices and livability that are below the pricing of today's lots and, and, and the density levels. This happens to get 15 to the acre, single family, detached, two story. These are all front loaded, so they're typical where you get garage and living and dining and, and some get a driveway, some get a three car garage, some get all sorts of things. These are 
basically 43 by 45 foot lots. And that will get us on a private drive, 15 to the acre, and all of these are alley loads, so they all have front doors to the outside. You can see they're pretty handsome little houses. Floor plans are pretty cool. This, so this is, you get a backyard, you get a patio, you get a living room, dining room, kitchen, idea space, Big two-car garage, and upstairs you get a bonus area, nice master, and two more bedrooms. So we're, we're basically building a box, but we've landscaped the box on the inside really, really nice. And then uh, we're going to start now going to, from that 15 to the acre, how do we jack the density up? How do we get more units? So this is basically pocket communities. Are anybody familiar with? Uh, Ross Chapin and the cottages in Seattle. So those are all these beautiful, traditional up in here, okay? Very, very popular. In fact, they now sell at 700 a foot. Crazy. This is Black Apple Community in Bentonville, Arkansas. So now we're talking Oregon, now we're talking Arkansas. And they're all based around these community public realm spaces. So we know they're successful, but who's going to pay 700 a foot? It's just not feasible. So can we start to take this and do something fresh and new with it? Remember the 45 by 110? Okay. In Phoenix, tons of them because developers start, that's their opening lot, is a 45 by 110. So they put anywhere from 1,700 square feet to 2,200 square feet, and that's their starter home. So with all of those, we started looking at, so 45 by 110, 45 by 110, 45 by, what if we took seven 45 by 110s into an existing neighborhood and we dropped in the pocket community. So this pocket community has units that face the front with garages. It has single story living, by the way. These two right here are 800 square foot little cottages. They can be two story, but we did them as, as single stories so that we might be able to, to get an empty nester or a single older adult you know, wanting those. We have a common area. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. We've doubled the density. The lot price went from forty-five thousand dollars down to twenty-two thousand dollars. We've cut the dirt price in half. So we developed this, and by the way, you can see how cool the elevations are. And having 50, 60% of our staff as millennials, we had them tell us what's the color palette? How do, what do we design these at? How, how do we make them cool for you? Well, they wanted white with a, with a little blotch of color. So the color you can see on the doors, this is the carriage unit above the garage, two-story with a garage, two-story with a garage, and two-story with a garage. In the back, We'll have a home like this where we've got kitchen, dining, living, and a bedroom down, and then a bedroom up with a huge outdoor deck. Something really, really cool. So we started looking at this, and, and you know, some builders started thinking, well, maybe we can do this. So we took two acres in Phoenix in a town called Gilbert, where they're doing all this redevelopment around the old downtown area. So this is a two acre site and we get 16 to the acre and the city shot us down. That's our problem, is overcoming the mentality and the agendas of the cities. But what this would have offered them is a whole different level of consumer and pricing and really a targeted group, if you will, that loves the renovation of downtown Gilbert. So, what happened surprised me. 
the first group that said, I want that, we're going to build it, is for rent. So you, un you heard a lot of the single family for rent that's coming up. Well, RPG out of Dallas, Texas, uh, which is Republic Properties Group, run by two millennials, said, we want that. So what we did was we took it, and there's your single story, there's the elevation, and we did more of a contemporary ranch style, and we put it in a for rent community, and you can see the two story. This is their community, all for rent within their community, so that when they're done selling to merchant builders, they're still clipping coupons on the for rent community that they developed. So we've started seeing this. This is, is, is one that, that IHP is looking at in Reno, and we're actually getting up to 21 to the acre, SFD, for rent. So we're getting a lot of, of these density achievement type of products in these mini communities. You can see the interior of the, uh, the courtyard can go different directions. This happens to be a huge sly tree house kind of, of, of product. Uh, or you can go to an entertainment zone with a party pavilion. So each one of these little pocket communities can have its own lifestyle, its own identity. So if we have that and we've put it into a 150 by 150, if we add another, so this will get 17 to the acre. If we add another 150 by 150, so now we're 300 by 150, 20 to the acre. Single family, detached, two story and single story boxes at 20 to the acre. And if we add one more, we now have 450 by 150. We get 31 units and you can call it a village. So some super cool ideas and this is, this is what is attracting the tolls and the wood sides, the tri points to actually start to enter a market with this type of product. Obviously, we have to get through the municipalities, but you can see all the different types of floor plans that we can generate as these small little mini homes. In fact, I think just to the north of us, there's some out here that you could go look at small little cottages that they have in the parking lot here. So as we start to look, we think about, remember I talked a little bit about private drives? Okay, so private drives are basically alleys. You know, they're 24-foot alleys. So how do we change them up? How do we make them look differently? We're putting small boxes. We're cramming a lot of, of living into small spaces. It goes where you need to have experiential lifestyle there besides that little common area. So we started thinking, why don't we change up the street scene? So basically what we're doing is in this case, when we have a cluster, we've added a few feet of width and we meander it. We cant it so it's not a straight drive. What that allows us to do is pick up parking where we've, we've manipulated and, and canted it and we've picked up landscaping pockets to soften up the impact on a straight through street, this is a straight through going through. This is 36 wide. Normally, a city on a public drive is gonna want you to do 60s. So at 36, we've picked up 24 feet of land that we didn't have to develop, and we're creating this 24 foot, and we're, we can alternate it back and forth, so it becomes character, and if we do it, enough, look at all the different ways that we can do a private drive. Each neighborhood could take on its own identity. So when you don't, you just don't tell them, hey, I'm on 2204 Applewood Lane, you can tell them, I live in the, in the bi bioswell where we've got landscaping going on, or I live in the sidewalk or the block party concept. So all of them then take on an identity to the people that are buying it and wanting to live in it. The other thing that we started working on, so you can kind of get an idea, remember the cluster we had just a private drive? 
All right, so we've banged our head against many municipalities. And you know what the, uh, the kickback is? Trash. Because they're all private contractors to cities. Well, I, I don't want to back my truck up. I, I, you've got you to give me a clear street all the way through. So what we start looking at is can we take and do a cluster where we actually have a full entrance or exit coming out, fire and trash, no problem. No complaint, sit down, we're not talking anymore. Then we put our little minis and, and, and smaller homes in here and we're getting 10 plus a little common area, we're getting yards, and so we're starting to get some traction on this. So what I wanted to show you is what if we took all these little ideas together? Remember we got the 150 by 150s, okay? We've got the clusters with the little mini homes. We've got the private drives. We have private drives that, that are continuous, all right? We call them traveling drives. With the landscape, come on, take up. What if we created a community that had all that in it and were able to get islands of homes? This is an island in here. Uh, this, is, this is a little island. This is an island. All with traveling drives, we've got 15 to 18% open space. There is not a home in here that is not connected to the community area or have paths that go to it. We can do green courts and auto courts. And this, this is a new builder that is, is entering the Phoenix market and looking at these type of concepts that become organic. It, how many flew in? Did you look out the window and look at the, the grid patterns of the houses? They're all just stacked together in grids and whatnot. Isn't that more interesting? Isn't that have a lot more landscaping? And yet we're still coming in with affordability, attainability. And so this is what's going to be starting to happen. And it'll take some time, uh, but it will happen. One of the one things that I wanted to kind of put up to you is buying a home is a discerning decision. Whoever is buying it doesn't have to buy it. They have to have shelter. That usually goes with rent or homeless. That's your two choices. But if you're going to buy, it's discerning. And everybody, no matter who that buyer is, has a dream quality. And that dream quality is usually done on huge homes. All the awards go to big houses, big elevations, big expensive stuff. How do we take some of the dream quality and put them in smaller homes where the everyman can, can afford it and still have a little piece of that dream? And so. As we go into this, your takeaways, I would say density, smaller lots, it's happening. It's a known fact, square footages are getting a little bit smaller. Families are getting a little bit smaller. We don't need 3,000 square feet anymore. The McMansion is almost all but dead. Um, we have lot configurations, so different forms of clustering, so we can pick up density. We have design, how do we do smaller but better scale and function? And then we have attainability is the most important factor, no matter what you're doing, no matter what market you're in. Personalization, how do you maximize it? Most, a lot of builders don't. A lot of builders are, Lennar's the EI program. You know, you get what I want you to have. You have your choice of three kitchen, two. Two kitchen cabinets and two granite tops. How would you feel if you walked into three of your neighbors and they all had the same kitchen? So that's, that's a, personalization is basically the ultimate want. Demographics are changing, target to them. Target to their lifestyle, target what turns them on, target to how they look and feel and think about owning a home and create better privatized outdoor spaces. 
And that's, that's it.